Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Vageshwari Deswal, teaching at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. Today we will discuss the module Dowry and Dowry Debts under the paper Women and Law for the discipline Women's Studies. The objectives of this module would be firstly to understand what constitutes dowry, secondly to understand what the law means by the term dowry death, thirdly to gain an insight into the legal provisions relating to dowry and dowry deaths in India and fourthly to understand what we as a society can do to tackle this menace. To begin with, let us understand what is dowry. Traditionally, dowry means gifts that are given by the parents of the bride to their daughter at the time of marriage. Dowry has its roots in the ancient Hindu customs of Kanyadan and Varadakshina, wherein parents voluntarily, out of their love and affection for their daughter, used to give her certain gifts and presents as a means of support to the newlyweds. They would shower them with their blessings and some gifts at the time of marriage so as to support them in their newly married life. But this practice which was initially done voluntarily out of love and affection, with the passage of time, it became a forced practice, wherein the groom and his family members, they started considering dowry as their birthright. And why should only the groom and his family members be the ones who are to be blamed? Sometimes we have seen that even the girl's family they get into this competition of giving higher and higher amounts of dowry in order to display their social status in the family. So slowly this transformed into a social evil. Now let us understand how the law defines dowry. We got the law relating to dowry that is the Dowry Prohibition Act in the year 1961. Thereafter, it was amended several times. The term dowry has been defined under Section 2 of the Dowry Prohibition Act 1961 as amended by the Dowry Prohibition Amendment Act of 1984 and 1986 as follows. Dowry means any property or valuable security given or agreed to be given either directly or indirectly by one party to a marriage to the other party to the marriage or by the parents of either party to a marriage or by any other person to either party to the marriage or to any other person at or before or any time after the marriage in connection with the marriage of the said parties but it does not include dower or meher in the case of persons to whom the Muslim personal law that is shariat applies. So we see that this definition it expressly excludes dower, dower which is covered by shariat that is the Muslim personal law. Thus on a perusal of the definition of dowry we can understand that there are three occasions related to dowry, three occasions wherein dowry can be given and that is before marriage at the time of marriage and at any time after the marriage. 
But what is necessary here is that such dowry, that is such gift has to be necessarily given in relation to the marriage of the parties. So we can see that our lawmakers have tried to keep the definition of dowry as comprehensive as possible so as to cover all sorts of monetary and exchanges which are done whether in money or in kind but any exchange that is related to marriage. Also in order to curb this practice of dowry our lawmakers have made the practice of both asking as well as giving of dowry a punishable crime for which punishment has been prescribed under the Dowry Prohibition Act and this carries an imprisonment for a term up to six months and fine of rupees 5000. And in order to curb this practice of giving and taking of dowry, Section 3 of the Dowry Prohibition Act has prescribed a punishment which is a minimum imprisonment of five years and fine of 15,000 rupees for those who give or take dowry. To further strengthen the law, in exercise of the powers given under Section 9 of the Dowry Prohibition Act 1961, the central government has enacted the Dowry Prohibition, Maintenance of Lists and Presents to the Bride and Bridegroom Rules 1985. These rules came into effect from the 2nd of October 1985. To get an insight into what these rules are, the dowry prohibition maintenance of lists and presents to the bride and bridegroom rules 1985, I would like to highlight the following points. As per these rules, the bride and the bridegroom shall maintain a list of presents which are given to him or her at the time of marriage or as soon as possible after the marriage. Such list shall be in writing and must contain the following. First, a brief description of each present. So whether the present is some electronic item or some item of home utility, some decorative or display item or something related to the kitchen, but description of each present has to be noted down in the list to avoid any sort of confusion in the future. Thereafter, the list should also contain the approximate value of present. See, it is difficult to determine with accuracy what is the exact value of every present that has been gifted to either the bride or the groom and that is why the law provides that even if we have an idea of the approximate value, that would suffice for the purposes of this list. Then, the name of the person who has given the present so as to ascertain in future that is where the present was received from so that it can be said with certainty that okay, this was the person who had given the present. Next, when the person giving the present is related to the bride or bridegroom, a description of such a relationship should also be given in the list so as to avoid any sort of confusion in the future whether the present was received from the side of the bride or from the bridegroom and in the end the list has to be necessarily signed by both the bride as well as the bridegroom. Now this is a step to avoid any sort of manipulations in the future so that it can be said with certainty that okay these were the presents which were received and this was endorsed by both the bride as well as the bridegroom. What do we mean by the term dowry debts? Dowry debts are debts of young women who are murdered or driven to suicide by continuous harassment and tension 
by husbands and in-laws in an effort to extort an increased dowry. So dowry death is a constructive homicide. This is the term that we use to describe dowry deaths. What is constructive homicide? That is, homicide means killing of a human being by another human being. And if a woman, whether she is killed or whether circumstances are constructed wherein she is compelled to take away her own life, then that is what we call as constructive homicide. So whether a woman driven by circumstances is compelled to take away her own life by committing suicide or even if she is killed by her in-laws, both these incidences would be covered under the term dowry deaths. So dowry death includes killing and suicide both. Now, let us understand the legislative provision to control dowry deaths. We got a law to curb the incidences of dowry demands which was the Dowry Prohibition Act in the year 1961. Despite this law, instances of dowry demands, they kept on increasing and then we witnessed a new phenomenon wherein women were killed for not fulfilling those dowry demands. So, in the year 1983, our legislators introduced a new provision in the Indian Penal Code. The provision was Section 498A, which dealt with protection of women against cruelty by their spouses or by any other family member of the husband's family. But instances and incidences of cruelty, they also kept on increasing. And so in the year 1986, our legislators introduced a provision in the Indian Penal Code. This provision was Section 304B, which defined dowry deaths as follows. The law says, when the death of a woman is caused by any burns or bodily injury or occurs otherwise than under normal circumstances, within seven years of her marriage and it is shown that soon before her death she was subjected to cruelty or harassment by her husband or any relative of her husband for or in connection with any demand for dowry then such death shall be called dowry death and such husband or relative shall be deemed to have caused her death. The law further provides that whoever commits dowry death shall be punished with imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than seven years but which may extend to imprisonment for life. Coming to the essential ingredients of section 304b that is dowry deaths. The first ingredient is death. C. Death is necessary to ensue in case there has to be a charge under Section 304B of the Indian Penal Code. If a woman is harmed or injured, howsoever critical that injury might be, if that injury does not result in her death, a charge of Section 304B cannot be brought against the accused because the provision is titled dowry deaths. So there has to be necessarily death of a woman in order to constitute a charge under this offence which is dowry deaths. The second ingredient is death to be caused by burns or bodily injury or otherwise than under normal circumstances. This means that death has to be a non-natural death. Now what do we understand by the term natural death? If a person dies under natural circumstances or under circumstances which suggest that there was no foul play of any sort 
then in such cases section 304b cannot be invoked if a woman dies because of some inevitable accident or because of some reason which can be attributable to some medical causes and in which foul play can be ruled out then all those incidences would not attract the applicability of section 304b 304b requires that the woman should have died a non natural death non natural death that is either she should have been burnt she should have suffered burns injuries or some bodily injuries which cannot be explained in the normal course that is injuries which suggest that definitely there is something more to this than meets the eye sometimes what happens that when a woman dies the family members they hurriedly cremate her or they hurriedly bury her without providing any opportunity for an autopsy or post mortem to be conducted in such cases there is a presumption that maybe the death was non natural otherwise what was the urgency to dispose of the body in such an unholy manner in cases of dowry deaths it is the responsibility of the prosecution to prove that death of the woman has occurred now this is an objective fact which it is very easy for the prosecution to prove that yes a woman has died secondly the prosecution needs to prove that the death was a non natural death again this is something which can be proven the third ingredient that the prosecution needs to prove is death it took place within 7 years of her marriage this is again something which can be proven objectively death has to necessarily take place within 7 years of the solemnization of her marriage in case the death of a woman has taken place when the statutory period of 7 years has already elapsed then it could be covered under some other statutory provision but not under section 304b of the indian penal code the fourth requirement is that the woman should have been subjected to cruelty or harassment by her husband or any relative of her husband if the death of the woman is not preceded by any sort of a cruelty or harassment that was meted out to her by her husband or any relative of her husband then the blame for her death would not be affixed on the husband or the husband's family members so it is necessary for the prosecution to prove that prior to her death the woman was subjected to any kind of a cruelty or harassment by her husband or his family members the cruelty or harassment that we are talking about here might be of any nature it might be physical or it might be mental so whether it is physical cruelty or mental cruelty whatsoever as is mentioned under section 498a of the indian penal code would suffice to constitute harassment or cruelty which is required to bring home a charge under section 304b but what is important here is that such a cruelty or harassment whether it was physical or mental in nature should be for or in connection with demand for dowry if the cruelty or harassment can be proven but a link cannot be established with a demand for dowry see there could be so many reasons why a woman is subjected to cruelty or harassment and every incidence of such cruelty or harassment is not necessarily in relation to a dowry demand so if the woman is driven to suicide or if the woman is killed on account of any other demand on account of any other cruelty or harassment which was not necessarily related to a dowry demand then it would not be covered under section 304b so in order to be covered under dowry debts it is necessary that the cruelty or harassment should be in relation to demand for dowry and another important point is that the harassment or cruelty should be shown to have been meted out to the woman soon before her death now how soon is soon 
this term or this expression soon before her death is a very elastic expression. What the prosecution needs to prove here is that there should be a live link or a perceptible nexus between the cruelty or harassment that was meted out to the woman and the death of the woman which to which took place on account of such cruelty or harassment that she was subjected to. If the incident of such cruelty or harassment had taken place much before the death of the woman occurred, then this would provide a ground to the defense to argue that such cruelty or harassment had no effect whatsoever on the woman and her death is totally unrelated to such incident of cruelty or harassment. Alongside Section 304B of the Indian Penal Code, another provision was inserted in the Indian Evidence Act 1872 and that is Section 113B, which lays down a presumption as to dowry death. See, ordinarily, in criminal cases, the burden of proof is on the prosecution. And this burden is to be discharged by the prosecution beyond reasonable doubt. And whenever there is any sort of a doubt, the benefit of doubt, it goes to the accused person. But under this provision, the onus has been shifted to the defense. Now, the prosecution only needs to prove that the woman has died under non-natural circumstances and soon before her death, the woman was subjected to either cruelty or harassment for or in connection with dowry demand. Beyond that, the onus it shifts to the defense and now they have to prove that the death of the woman was not a non-natural death or even if it was a non-natural death, they need to establish their innocence by proving that they did not subject the woman to any cruelty or harassment or even if there was any cruelty or harassment meted out to the woman, then it was totally unrelated to any dowry demand. If the prosecution can establish these things, that is, the woman has died, she has died within seven years of her marriage, and uh, she was subjected to any cruelty or harassment in relation to demand for dowry soon before her death, then there is a presumption that the woman was subjected to dowry death. And now the burden it shifts to the defense to establish their innocence. What section 113B of the Indian Evidence Act 1872 says is, that when the question is whether a person has committed the dowry death of a woman and it is shown that soon before her death such woman had been subjected by such person to cruelty or harassment for or in connection with any demand for dowry the court shall presume that such person had caused the dowry death. There is an explanation appended to this section which says that for the purposes of this section, dowry death shall have the same meaning as in section 304b of the Indian Penal Code. In many of the cases, our judiciary has also shown its concern over dowry deaths and other offences related to demand of dowry. In the case of Satya Narayan Tiwari and another versus State of UP, the Supreme Court had remarked that although bride burning and bride hanging cases have become common in our country, in our opinion, the expression rarest of rare as referred in Bachchan Singh versus State of Punjab do not mean that the act is uncommon. It means that the act is brutal and barbaric and bride killing is certainly barbaric which warrants the punishment which is extreme in law. Another case of Ratanlal versus State of Madhya Pradesh, in this case the court stated that in dowry death cases and in most of such offences, direct evidence is hardly available and such cases are usually proved by 
circumstantial evidence. And that is the reason why Section 113B was inserted in the Indian Evidence Act. What this provision does is that it enacts a rule of presumption. That is, if the death of a woman occurs within seven years of marriage in suspicious circumstances, then it is presumed to be a case of dowry death. Thus, it is obligatory on the part of prosecution to show that the death occurred within seven years of marriage. If the prosecution fails to establish the same, then this section would not apply. Further, in the case of Shanti versus State of Haryana also, the Supreme Court had held that once the death of a woman is found to be unnatural, either homicidal or suicidal, Section 304B of the IPC has to be attracted. Punishment for dowry death has been prescribed under Section 304B, Clause 2 of the Indian Penal Code 1860. The provision states that whoever commits dowry death shall be punished with imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than seven years but which may extend to imprisonment for life. See, ordinarily, what happens in criminal cases, what the legislator prescribes is the statutory maximum. And then there is a discretion with the judges that if they feel that there is a possibility that the offender might reform in future or sometimes there is a possibility that the offender might have committed the offence in a sudden fight or due to some grave or sudden provocation or there might be some other reasons which made the offender behave in this particular manner and this was a one of its kind offence and there is a very less probability that the offender might repeat such kind of an act or such kind of a behaviour in future. So then in such cases there is a discretion with the judges that if they want, they may award a lesser punishment than the prescribed maximum. But what has happened in this particular case that the lawmakers, they have prescribed a statutory minimum. That is, in no event shall, an pers shall a person who has been convicted for an offence of dowry death be punished with imprisonment for a term which is less than seven years. And further, there is a discretion with the judges that if they want, they may award even a higher punishment. So we see that dowry laws were framed in the year 1961. Section 498A was introduced in the Indian Penal Code in the year 1983 to tackle cruelty against married women. This was followed up with the insertion of a specific provision relating to dowry deaths, Section 304B and Section 113B, which is presumption as to dowry deaths, which was inserted in the Indian Evidence Act. These two provisions were introduced in the year 1986. But despite so many statutory provisions, what we have seen is that these incidents have not abated. As per official data, on an average, one Indian woman becomes a victim of dowry death every four hours in India. The data is scary. The situation is indeed very bad. Despite various legislations, the menace of dowry deaths is unfortunately increasing at an alarming speed. Ordinarily, legislations are based on public opinion. But at times, even legislations create public opinion. Regrettably, despite many legislations, we have not been able to control dowry deaths. Perhaps, greater social awareness and more severe legislative measures are urgently required to curb the menace of dowry deaths. To our information, in no other civilized country, 
similar problem of this magnitude exists. This is indeed a slur on our great heritage, ancient culture and civilization. I would also like to point out that not in all cases of dowry and dowry debts are the groom and his family members to be blamed. The members of the girl's family also need to adopt a zero tolerance approach. The moment their girl complains, they need to take an action there and then. Usually, what we do, we keep on telling the girl to adjust, that time would eventually set all things right. But this doesn't happen. And when the woman dies, when she comes to this pressure, commits suicide or is killed by her in-laws, then the girl's parents, they cry hoarse. Now, wasn't it their responsibility to act it, to have acted timely and brought their girl home or taken an action against the erring in-laws? But this is something which we don't do. See, every demand for dowry is a death threat and we need to walk away from that. Let us take a pledge that we will neither give dowry nor will we demand dowry. In my idea, that would be the greatest step to contain this evil. Thank you.